So what I want to do in my, uh, in my talk today is to present uh, a new methodology uh, for the anthropological study of uh, skilled action and more specifically of material uh, uh, creative practices. Uh, the name of this method is perspectival kinesthetic imaging and is designed to facilitate the multimodal sensitivity needed for studying the sentient dimensions, uh, conditions, and possibilities of creative material engagement. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging uh, combines uh, the descriptive power of anthropological participant observation with the discursive breadth uh, of material semiotics, uh, which is the term I will use to denote the science of uh, material relations and an active science. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging has been developed and applied within uh, uh, the context of an ERC uh, funded research project, uh, which I direct and which tries to understand the process of making by hand, uh, focusing on the craft of ceramics. The principal objective of the handmade project is to follow the creative transactions between uh, hand and clay, trying to understand the cognitive ecology of their entanglement. To that end, since 2018, our research group undertakes a multi-sided participant observation, uh, working with more than 30 potters and ceramists in mainland Greece and the islands. We have been studying uh, uh, their bodily skills, creative gestures, and modes of material imagination. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is the product of this attempt to devise a more efficient way to identify, observe, record, and analyze the potter's commitment to the inactive uh, discovery and reproduction of forms, old forms and new forms. Although the focus of the handmade project is on clay and pottery making, the methodology presented as well as the theoretical framework of material engagement theory uh, from which it derives may apply to the study <clears throat> of all crafts and settings of skilled creative action. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is advanced as a method that opens up new anthropological possibilities for the study of the relationship between making and thinking, as this can be observed in the field. As such, it can be described also as a form of contemporary cognitive archaeology, as well as uh, a way of practicing material semiotics. By material semiotics, I'm referring to the study of material signs and the processes of meaning making by means of an active signification. To explain in brief, uh, the distinctive feature of material semiotics is that the meaning cannot be considered before or outside the field of material relations with uh, which it is enacted. That basically means that the materiality of science uh, matters. It means that their mat the material constitution, their becoming, is an inseparable part of their meaningful engagement. Experiencing the affordances of clay, to give an example, precedes any meaning or concept we associate with this material. The process by which the meaning of material science emerges is called an active signification. The distinctive feature of an active signification is that it operates on the principle of participation rather than uh, that of symbolic or representational equivalency. The basic idea here is that we should collapse the representational distance between the signifier and the signified and think of the sign as a cohabitation through matter that enacts and brings forth the world. So my talk is going to be uh, structured uh, in three main uh, major parts. Uh, I, I start by briefly presenting uh, our, the theoretical framework, material engagement theory. Uh, then I set out to explore the different aspects of perspectival kinesthetic imaging 
and discuss in turn uh, each of its major components. And at the end, I will consider the role and contribution of perspectival kinesthetic imaging in the current landscape uh, of material uh, semiotics and the anthropology of skilled uh, practices. So I begin with uh, my theoretical framework. The approach that the handmade project adopts to the study of making follows the principles of material engagement theory. The distinctive uh, feature of this theoretical framework is that it proposes a radical continuity between thinking and making. Thinking is in the making or else making is thinking. The three core assumptions of the material engagement approach are that, and you can see them also in summary, mind is not limited by the skin, what we may call the extended mind hypothesis, different meanings here, but just let's keep this term for simplicity. Uh, uh, second, a meaning is enacted uh, through things, what we may call an active signification. And last, uh, the notion of material agency. Agency is a relational property of people and things, not of isolated individuals or of isolated objects. From the perspective of material engagement theory, the clay at the potter's hand is not a passive material substance for the imposition of form, but an active part of the potter's hylonoetic uh, field. Uh, from the term hylonoetic comes from the Greek words hely for matter and noesis for intelligence. Mind and matter for a unity. In the context uh, of material engagement theory, the term thinking is used to denote this cognitive ecology of moving materials, emerging forms, environments, and techniques that characterize human thinking and feeling with and through things. These are ideas that draw upon and resonate uh, with old and new and active and ecological trends in philosophy and cognitive science, uh, the anthropology of distributed cognition, uh, creativity and notions of enskillment as also developed by uh, Tim Ingle, uh, who will be speaking later on. Another major source of inspiration, uh, again from uh, Tim Ingle, comes from his innovative attempt at redrawing anthropology by following the materials, learning the movements and drawing the lines. Last, I also saw elements of the new materialist and post-humanist vision for a rethinking of matter as vibrant and lively. However, it is important to clarify that from a material engagement perspective, the aim is not to ascribe agency and vitality to matter as separate from the agency of humans, but instead to recognize that the two are inseparable. More simply, the basic aim is to provide a new starting point that allows us to join forces with matter and to take advantage, uh, advantage of instead of hiding from the intimate connections between humans and things. One rather uh, pers persistent mistake that continue to raise obstacles in our way to meet this challenge has been the common representational assumption that mental states are unobservable, that they can only be inferred based on indirect cues since they have no recognizable material trail or track uh, uh, outside the brain. Under the spell of modernity, we are convinced that human cognitive life and creative imagination must be firmly located inside our heads. This old ontological split between mind and matter seems hard to overcome. It's still uh, largely, uh, largely defines the way we think about what counts as thinking, as real thinking, and how we should go about studying human cognitive processes. This ontological split also explains our tendency to believe that although humans create and use a variety of material forms, they don't think with and through them, rather we only think about them. This difference between thinking with and thinking about is a difference that makes a difference. 
the latter implies that mind and material world must be separate, connected by means of representation. The former opens the way for, a, for the relational constitution of cognition and material culture. It is this constitutive intertwining of cognition and material culture that defines material engagement theory and provides the foundation for the methodology of perspectival kinesthetic imaging. So to use an analogy, as functional brain imaging allows to trace creative thinking by detecting changes associated with blood flow inside our heads, so perspectival kinesthetic imaging help us to track our creative thinking inside the world by detecting changes associated with the flow of bodily movement and materials. In the, case, in the case of functional brain imaging, creative activity is measured because of chemical changes in the blood related to uh, energy use uh, by brain cells. In the case of perspectival kinesthetic imaging, creative activity is picked up through the tracing and capturing of gestures and an active material science. So let's take a closer look uh, at what perspectival kinesthetic imaging is really about. To begin, it is worth repeating that this methodology can only fulfill its goals as part of a rigorous anthropological inquiry based on long-term commitment to the immersive interaction with participants during fieldwork. What differentiates perspectival kinesthetic imaging from traditional participant observation is that it is especially designed to facilitate the responsiveness to the sensory modalities and material relations needed for the anthropological study of skilled material practices. One possible way to facilitate this kind of responsiveness is through the control selective juxtaposition of perspectival viewpoints on the process of making. Perspectival here denotes the dependence of observation on the affordances of the media and techniques we use uh, to observe with and through. These media and techniques enact different perspectives that affect how we observe and what can be observed. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is essentially turning those codependencies of the knower and the known, of knowledge and observation, into a kind of bypassing strategy. This is made possible through the selective juxtaposition of multiple media, which are used like traps for capturing in the wild material transformations and bodily movements that matter to the process of making. We call them uh, multimodal visual captures. For our purpose in the uh, handmade project, we employ four such multimodal visual captures. Uh, photography, uh, videography, drawing, and mobile eye tracking. Of course, more media and techniques may be added targeting different material practices, senses, and temporal scales. I will discuss the respective contribution of each of these media separately. But first, I want to present and clarify some of the distinctive features uh, they share in common. I begin with the meaning of imaging. We should note, cautioning against a possible misunderstanding, that perspectival kinesthetic imaging should not be confused for a method targeting primarily the visual aspects of making. Unlike other image making practices, the aim of perspectival kinesthetic imaging is not merely to visualize, but to record or to record uh, visual phenomena, but rather to capture selective multisensorial aspects of creative practice. This is why uh, I use the term multimodal visual captures to characterize the different media involved. The term multimodal is adapted from uh, multimodality studies to emphasize the special interest on material semiotic uh, resources, uh, uh, modes of an active signification. Some of those multimodal aspects of making 
are readily visible, both in video and photography, embodied, for instance, in language, gaze, sound, gesture, as well as uh, the use of tools and materials. However, it is also uh, the case that important aspects of uh, uh, the creative process often remain unseen and are hard to observe. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging can make those invisible aspects uh, visible and rather render them available uh, for analysis. In short, uh, the aim of uh, imaging uh, in perspectival kinesthetic imaging is not to provide a visual record of creative activity, but a new way to participate with it, coupling the movement of the potter with the observer's attention. Imaging does not refer to the product, but to the medium of participation. It is for this reason that perspectival kinesthetic imaging can also be described as a mode of practicing material and active semiotics. It combines archaeological traceology, that is the study of material traces and indexes, with sensory anthropology, aiming to produce multimodal outputs that ground and expand traditional visual methodolo methodologies and narratives. This brings us to the second uh, distinctive feature of perspectival kinesthetic imaging. Uh, which is uh, juxtaposition. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging works on the principle of selective juxtaposition. The basic uh, idea here is that uh, the juxtaposition, layering, and comparison of different multimodal visual captures enables the discovery of relations that are often obscured or may seem fragmented and disconnected when seen from a single perspectival point. Each of these multimodal visual captures enacts distinct imagistic practices, digital or analog. They also embody different temporalities. For instance, the observational uh, drawings produced by the artist uh, of a project, although synchronic, are not readily comparable with the photographs taken by the project photographer. Sorry about that. They all relate to the same event that happens in a specific time period, but they embody and express time in different ways. This multi-temporality, far from a problem, offers an epistemological advantage. Its multimodal visual capture affords a specific spatiotemporal positioning, namely a perspective from which to identify and observe kinesthetic events of interest. The term kines kinesthesis is used in the motional sense of thinking in movement as described by uh, Maxine Sid Johnston. Kinesthetic events uh, of interest should not be confused with technical stages, uh, grips or techniques. Events of interest are usually discovered in areas of creative tension or friction that are usually associated with transitional movements which occur in between technical changes, sorry, stages, beginnings and endings, uh, often with no particular uh, order. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging allows us for those events uh, to be arranged chronologically as a sequential spatial arrangement, but also dynamically as a composition or orchestration of rhythmic bodily movement. This is especially suited for the study of crafts and skilled material practices where no general rules can be used to pre Scribe in any detail the contingencies of situated action. To study craft and creative gesture, you must be able to uh, follow and learn, also unlearn, from the ways of the hand. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is a theft, an abductive process by which indexes of bodily movement on clay 
and of clay movement on the body are being suspended and dislocated from the time and place in which they occur, in a sense, stolen from the flow of activity to be examined separately in juxtaposition with other selected events during the elicitation phase. Combined with phenomenological interviewing, this selective juxtaposition allows us to capture events of interest that occur at different temporal scales during the process of making. For instance, some creative gestures are short-lived and leave no visible trace, while others endure for much longer uh, periods of time, leaving a permanent uh, memory or other trace along uh, uh, after the completion, long after the completion. I will now discuss uh, each of those uh, uh, multimodal visual captures, starting with photography and videography. The thing uh, to note is that both the use of photography and video are more than just means of documenting actions. Both video and photography are part of a theory-driven research process that is seeking ways of attending to the sensory experience and creative processes associated with the observed material practices. Our concern is with developing effective techniques for studying craft as a bodily practice rather than uh, with interpreting of the visual content and meanings of photographs and videos as uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, visual representations of skilled actions. The images uh, produced in the context of perspectival kinesthetic imaging are mostly generated uh, by the participant researchers. The potters are also involved in the process of image selection and interpretation during the elicitation phase. Photo elicitation involves inserting uh, selected photographs or edited video footage uh, related to pre-identified events of interest into the structure of the interview. The major function of the photographs and footages selected as elicitation prompts is to facilitate observation and dialogue between the anthropologist and the ceramist. The potter's comments and responses are recorded for later analysis and additional photographs are subsequently selected and used as prompts to elicit further information. Moreover, repeated viewings of the photos often reveals changes in the porter's understanding of the processes depicted. Also, the selection of images and the editing of the video footage is often participatory, allowing the porter to take part in the analysis and interpretation of the photographic shots, as well as looking at footage in order to guide the detection and selection of significant bodily movement, movements and non-verbal uh, behavior. This participatory process allows the potters to influence what is seen, recorded, and analyzed. The project uh, team also includes a professional photographer, uh, uh, Rory Carnegie, who has been producing a series of event-specific photographs of the potter's performances and actions. We have been trying to capture specific events in the process of making, harnessing the ability of photography to materialize them by condensing time and movement. For instance, the blurring in this picture is intentional. We have been trying to find ways to capture process in single shots. What you see is actually the blending of many moments in a single photo. All the images speak of the process they were uh, taken with and were taken with such a process-oriented consideration in mind. The transtemporal trans blurring of the potting images creates an aesthetic of displacement and dispossession that allows new ways of imagining skill and the temporality of making. This uh, gives us access to the potter's material imagination. 
We are also attentive to photography and videography as practices and skills in themselves. And we have been exploring their positioning as creative performances within the choreography of pottery making. That means that the process of framing, setting up, anticipating and taking the shot, as well as the movement of the participants' body, bodies, participants, those who are making the pots and those who are making the images, are as important for an analysis as the subsequent uh, and the subsequent uh, critical uh, processes of selecting uh, which sorts uh, are worth exhibiting, as well as which sorts will be edited or used for the elicitation stage. We should also be reminded that clay is not always cooperating with the potters, uh, with the potter, the photographer, or the videographer. Photography and videography require a highly concentrated level of decision making about capturing or not capturing specific moment uh, in the sequence in which an event uh, unfolds. There are constraints here imposed by the speed of the wheel and the throwing activity, as well as by the skilled vision of the photographer and the videographer. Within uh, the material ecology of perspective or kinesthetic imaging, both the use of photography uh, and video have proven to be powerful analytical tools that can help overcome some traditional limitations of other interpretive methodologies. The combination of photography, video, and observational drawing, which I will discuss now, offers an especially pertinent means to express this intertwinement uh, of mind and matter, or in our case, of potter and clay. Observational drawing, like any other component of perspectival kinesthetic imaging, is a way uh, of gaining knowledge by merging participation with observation. The basic idea behind observational drawing is uh, simple, uh, that you are drawing in order to see, rather than drawing what you see. As such, Observational drawing requires active, active bodily engagement with the processes observed. Observational drawing enhances the participant's responsiveness and attentiveness to the situation. It adds to perspectival kinesthetic imaging a mode of capturing that allows us to stabilize and thus to see unnoticed processes and movements on paper. Miranda Creswell, the artist of the handmade project, has been pr producing over uh, 200 uh, observational sketches following the potter's hand and movements of, uh, of materials. She has been traveling with the research team, making drawings on site and in real time, informed by the general research objectives. The aim has been to capture and to highlight through observational drawing issues of memory temporality, and the tactility of making. These are uh, process drawings, lacking obvious points of commencement or initiation. Their, their role is to complement the understanding of process and the ident identification of events of interest, rather than to visualize uh, or visually represent aspects or stages of making. Admittedly, the materiality and tangibility of drawing uh, has proven especially valuable. The research team found it uh, stimulating to display and compare these drawings, exploring how they could be read in a particular way or another, asking questions and discussing observations with the artist. Observational drawing offers some distinctive affordances for studying skilled movements and material practices. For instance, 
one important contribution of observational sketching compared uh, with other media, for instance, photographs that emerged uh, early on in our project has been the ability of drawing to graphically enhance and underline onto paper distinctive bodily gestures and choreographies of action. The choreography of participant observation is of special interest. Looking at the video recordings of Questwell's process, process drawings, we notice that uh, the intensity of her gestures while drawing often correspond with and reflect the vitality of the potter's movement and the shaping of clay. This observational attunement is also visible in the final drawings that provide indexical signs uh, of this intention, uh, be, of this tension between the depicted and the depicting gestures. A similar correspondence or attunement has been observed also in the case of other visual captures during uh, photographing and filming. And I would like to turn to mobile eye tracking. The development of mobile eye tracking in recent years allows experimentation with eye movements in the wild, that is, while action happen, happens in real time. The process of making can be recorded, tracking the eye's pathway in relation to the pathways of the hand. In the context of the handmade project, we use mobile eye tracking to capture motion and to understand where and how the eye of the potter touches the clay in the same way that we seek to understand where and how the hand of the potter touches the clay. Ultimately, uh, our concern is to understand the dynamics of attention and the temporality of making. This also means that the logic behind the use of mobile eye tracking as part of perspectival kinesthetic imaging is different from what we find uh, in the psychological applications of that methodology. We employ a mobile eye tracking in order to follow and track the invisible path created by the eye, um, eye movements of the potter during the task. This path, uh, made of uh, made up of fixation uh, strings linked by succade, tells us uh, where and for how long uh, the potter's eye is touching the clay, which we can then compare with the parallel visible trace left where the hand is touching the clay. And here are some examples of some heat maps that give you an idea of those concentrations. This form of real-time eye-hand tracking provides useful insights for understanding the temporality and multimodality of the potter's attention. It allows us uh, to follow the movement of the eye parallel to the movement of the hand and to understand the temporal structure and correspondences of tactile and visual modes of attentive material engagement. This has also proven to be an especially productive analytical tool for video elicitation and phenomenological interviewing that I discuss next. The difficulties of becoming aware of and describing subjective experiences associated with skilled practices are well known. Being an expert in pottery making does not necessarily imply or necessitate the ability to produce verbal descriptions of the various experiences and the processes involved. The difficulties uh, verbalizing lived experience are many. We should not forget that during the process of making, the potter's attention is usually absorbed often entirely by the desired task to be achieved and only peripherally by the actual way in which this objective is to be achieved. Potters spend little time consciously thinking about the doings. They are more concerned with doing their thinking. This form of tacit 
material knowledge is often being described as proportional to the potter's level of skill. It is also described as mindless since it does not require deliberate conscious attention. Now, without denying the close relation between the level of skill and the capacity for material imagination, I want to argue that there is nothing in the latter process that could be uh, seen or described as mindless. Quite the contrary, it can be more accurately be described as mindful. There are good reasons why the potters have little reflective awareness and thus memory of the cognitive and bodily processes that enable them to achieve their objectives. Such an awareness would have diverted their attention from their performance and towards the processes that enable them to achieve it. In this connection, the use of phenomenological interviewing facilitates the description and exposition of the potter's tacit knowledge, as well as highlight key aspects of their ability to imagine with and through clay. Technically, by phenomenological interviewing, we refer to the interview method of descriptive phenomenology. The method was originally developed and employed in cognitive science, including clinical and therapeutic domains, in order to provide in-depth descriptions of lived experience. These descriptions could be used to identify pre-reflective experiential invariants which constitute the structure of the experience under study. Within the context of the handmade project, we employ similar phenomenologically inspired, but importantly, ethnographically responsive interview methods attentive to the affective material forces that constrain and connect the forms that the portals create and the stories they tell in correspondence to their creations. Our principal aim in using phenomenological interviewing is to bring the portal into contact with the different technical dimensions of the creative process that enable uh, uh, connections with their felt meaning, uh, making possible to reenact aspects of their lived experience and switch from pre-reflective to reflective modes of creative material uh, engagement. To elicit as nuanced descriptions as possible, uh, we combine phenomenological interviewing with photo and video elicitation. Inserting selected photographs or edited video footage uh, related to pre-identified events of interest in the structure of the interview. Photo and video elicitation enhances recollection of events discussed, the recollection of events discussed uh, with the porters and help to avoid misunderstandings in putting the experience into words. Moreover, photo elicitation provides a medium for remembering, which affords a different mode of recollection than through traditional uh, verbal, verbal based interviews. Images provide a semiotic field of temporal associations for participants to reflect on the meaning of their actions. Captured in film or photographs, those actions become available to think with in ways that would have been otherwise impossible to imagine, remember, reenact, and communicate. Photo and video elicitation is also disruptive in a positive sense, allowing for surprise and the redirection of attention. For instance, watching eye tracking videos provides a powerful medium of elicitation that enables the ceramist to become aware of the exact timing and interplay between vision and touch. By way of conclusion, 
I would like to uh, highlight uh, a few major points uh, that could be emphasized. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is a research tool for the study of skilled creative practices and the mapping of their associated cognitive ecologies. Overall, perspectival kinesthetic imaging is a process-oriented method, targeting modes of becoming rather than being. With perspectival kinesthetic imaging, attention is moved from things as objects of human thought and imagination to things as processes of material imagination. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging provides multimodal depictions allowing, allowing juxtapositions of events and the discovery of meaningful connections contributing towards uh, a unified science of creative uh, imagination, and especially creative material engagement. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging, more than a tool for visual recording and, represent, and representing, is itself a multimodal technique that helps us overcome the limitations of traditional observational and visual methods relevant uh, uh, to understanding the felt, sensorial, or affective dimensions of craft. The aim of perspectival kinesthetic imaging in this context is not to generate a serial record of events that would have been hard to document otherwise, but to provide a possible means for the identification and comparison of selective events that matter. The mattering, I refer, is uh, of course situational. In the context of the handmade project, these are events associated with creative gestures which also means that they occur in between beginnings and endings. However, we define beginning and endings uh, and whatever the scale of activity which is to focus upon. The captured events of interest are dynamic and temporally emergent, meaning they change during the process of analysis. Important to note, relevant to the participatory character of this methodology, is that there are no pre-specified and prescribed rules about what events should be captured and in what way. The research design is flexible and responsive to new insights and findings as they emerge in the field. As it happens with anthropological studies, it is the field that decides where to draw boundaries and what would be the focus of the tracking. This constant need to be attentive and responsive to the contingency and materiality of action also explains why multimodal visual captures are moving rather than fixed. Their spatiotemporal positioning needs to resonate with the movements of the porters and the changing rhythms of actions that occur in different stages of the process and often have different requirements in terms of skill, skill and attention. So although to give an example, some of the cameras can be fixed at specific positions and viewing angles, focusing on specific parts of the porter's body, it is more common that the participants will be constantly moving in response to the porter's movement. That also means that its participant eventually creates a distinctive track record mapping and capturing different regions or events of interest. At the end of the process, the different records are compared and juxtaposed. This uh, provides the basis for our comparative analysis as it is during that stage of juxtaposition where interesting patterns previously unseen emerge and form the basis of our research design. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging is part of the process of selection or hypothesis formation by which we choose the kinesthetic events of interest that will be used in subsequent analysis and comparison. In other words, it embodies already at the level of description and recording important analytical choices that derive from previous research and influence what to capture and not capture. We engage the porters with a specific set of questions and objectives that we want to explore. At the same time, the porters' expertise will inevitably shape the content 
and steer the directions of the questions and observations, as well as the nature of anthropological comparisons and descriptions. One advantage of perspectival kinesthetic imaging <clears throat> is that it allows what uh, Tim Ingle would call a forward tracing of creativity by following the, improv uh, the, the creative movements and creative gestures that give rise to form. This can be contrasted uh, with the usual backward reading of creativity, which traces the novelty of actions by looking for their antecedent causes in uh, the brains of the potter. To end, not just pottery making, but any craft enacts time and imagination in ways that still resist appropriation by our consumptive, uh, consumptive uh, capitalist value system. There are lessons that the cognitive and material ecology of craft can teach us about the nature, nature of the creative process. We need methods and theories that help us to study those lessons in meaning making that things and materials can offer. It is a common assumption in the anthropology of craft that much of what we study cannot be adequately described using words alone. Perspectival kinesthetic imaging as a method of practicing material semiotics can aid anthropological analysis, creating new kinds of immersive knowledge and modes of participatory observation, which allow us to look at skilled practices and to explore material relations from, inside, from the inside out. The use of various multisensory techniques enables us to image and capture the affective dynamics and temporal structures of creative gesture, as well as to compare among individuals. A further strength of perspectival imaging is that it provides a bridge between art and anthropology, overcoming several epistemological asymmetries. It also highlights the tactility of seeing and offers a multimodal lens for exploring skilled creative practices. Crafts like pottery making offer a good place to start. I say that because I believe that craft provide that special place where materials become alive and are allowed to speak and to influence the morphogenetic process. However, the reason that within craft, materials and things are allowed to speak is not because all of a sudden they develop a voice. Rather, it is because through craft, we learn how to listen. In the care and attentiveness that characterize the dialogue between maker and material, we could find, could find guidance for how to imagine a better future, a future with human touch. The study of handicraft is more timely than ever because it is through craft that human bodies learn to care about things and value meaningful material engagement. The process of attentive material engagement and an active signification which are inherent in craft makes it possible for things to matter and for us to understand how they come to matter. And I will end here. Thank you very much. Or two questions. Make them long. <laughs> uh, yeah. so Thanks a lot, Lambros. I mean, amazing talk and such a fascinating project. I just have one question that is partly motivated by your concluding remarks where you were talking about the dialogue between the Author and and the material, uh, and I, I'm I was wondering to what extent uh, your uh, your focus on the theory engagement is kind of pushing you towards a position where uh, the boundary between material engagement and social engagement is kind of becoming blurred. And, and one reason for asking that question 
is that a few years ago, uh, a, a paper came out with, with uh, by uh, uh, Brink and Reddy, basically arguing, discussing pottery making, basically arguing that the relationship between the potter and the clay could be described as a second person engagement or as an I thou relationship. I have to say, I'm personally very skeptical of that approach, but I was just curious whether you kind of are moving in that direction. Could you kind of say something about that? Uh, okay, many thanks, Dan. Uh, that's a very uh, useful question to make some explanation further. Uh, first of all, there are two things about the social. Very often people think that the social is absent if, they, if you don't explicitly talk about the social. Nothing that we see here is asocial. social. So let's, let's forget the, this old separation because the social, the will is social, the clay is social, all the practices and skills that you see are social by definition as are thinking. Now, in terms of uh, uh, using the, the metaphor that you uh, explained, I mean, how far we want to go describing this relationship. I mean, the dialectical nature is an old uh, discussion we have and an old description of those kind of the relationship. I'm not saying actually that uh, there is a dialogue in the linguistic sense of the term. I think that whatever we, we, we want to uh, infer by means of that dialogue needs to come out from, of, from the um, bodily uh, and affective and tactile aspect of it, which relates with your ability to attend uh, to the material and to respond to uh, and, and realize affordances of that material. Now, in terms of... Uh, um, to whether we can see here the equivalent of a social relationship, the answer is yes, but that yes depends on, on the level of skill and uh, attentiveness to the material, meaning it's not something you can take for granted. But for many of those potters that I have been studying, which most of them are experts in, in what they do, and expertise is not just an issue of skill, it's also a lifestyle. I mean, they, this is how they, 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 they live, uh, through clay. Uh, so for them, this is a social relation. Uh, and in, in, in many cases, you could see the equivalent of the relation between two human individuals. So you have this participatory sense-making, to, to use this term of describing, all the time. And this is how they respond to the affordance of the material. And this is how this kind of... Uh, uh, interaction, which can have again many different meanings, uh, develops. You could easily describe that as, as a social uh, relation in the way we describe social relations. There are, of course, interesting differences, but not because they do not or cannot be described as social. There are differences in terms of how very often and, you know, different people think about the social. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's a lot of questions yeah, sorry. there. I mean, that's a Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Lamborghini. It was fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I'm um, curious about two things. The first is the uh, selection of the event of interest. Since you have an entire team there, how do you get them on the same page of what is the event of interest? And you already mentioned that it changes in the process of analysis, but then still you need to capture the right thing, no? when you're drawing the wrong thing uh, in the sense of what is significant, then you miss it out. And the, and the significant thing might be that he went to the river that morning to get the great yeah. clay. And then yeah. how do you deal with that? Uh, and then uh, out of curiosity, how do you publish this in an integrated way? Because there's all these uh, ways of knowledge and, and analysis that you bring together here in a talk. But how do you get it into... Uh, into a journal article or into another way of publishing it in the academic world, which isn't that open to all these uh, different ways of visualizing often. Yeah. Okay, no, okay. Okay, now about the, the first part of your question, this, this is challenging and not everybody in the project comes from an anthropological point of view. So uh, the photographer is a photographer and, and he's not playing the role of an anthropologist. Of course, they are all working as a, we work as a group they are familiar with what we are trying to do here. So there are certain guidelines, but everybody is flexible to do what they think brings them closer uh, to express something interesting about the process that we observe. That is the, the basic constraint. Then we select all those different, uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, expressions. And as a group, 
with the potters, uh, we are trying to make some decision about what of all this might be closer to helping us understand and explain certain phenomena. Uh, so this is an ongoing process. And very often we have changed decisions that we took a, a year ago on the basis of new findings. But it, is, um, uh, it works well. And I think that uh, uh, blending those different perspectives really gives you more to think about, but also gives the potters a lot in terms of their elicitation analysis. I think the most interesting part is how the potters respond, for instance, to the drawings or to the videos or to the photographs, because they can see things that very often they were not going to discuss on their own. And then you give them uh, uh, the photograph or you uh, show them something with the eye tracking that they could never have uh, seen uh, themselves. And that provides uh, possibilities for a new kind of discussion, uh, which very often is uh, surprising. I mean, how, more, how much you can learn by using those things. Uh, in terms of the publication, that's the, the you know, uh, eventually somebody needs to put a story together and create an argument. And th this is what we are trying to do in different ways and for different journals. It's not always easy. Uh, we are trying to res resist as much as we can uh, the, the fixed uh, um, way of doing things. Uh, and, uh, but there are ways that you can write about that and you can present some of that. Uh, and uh, I think it, 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 you know, it, it works fine so far. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I was very fascinated by the idea of creative gestures and um, the idea of making the invisible visible. And um, I was very much wondering um, what would happen if you would um, transfer this idea um, to reading a book or even playing an instrument. So watching someone read, watching someone playing an instrument and the creative gestures involved in this. Um, so my question is, is there some sort of attentive engagement with a book, with an instrument via this form of, of imaging that allows a different form of participation or um, identification or even resonance? Yes, thank you very much. Well, I, 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 I think that the different practices and skills will have their own uh, ways of, uh, of uh, approaching them. So it, I don't think that uh, if you just apply the same methodology uh, in the case of reading, for instance, you're going to immediately to get a similar results because it's a different process involved. You need to uh, try and think what you want to learn about reading as, as, a, as a broader phenomenon and what kind of media or techniques can help you and combine uh, them to do so. Uh, I'm not sure, for instance, what uh, you can learn by means of observational drawing in terms of reading, simply because a lot of uh, the creative gesturing that we could see in the reading process is not always uh, um, translated in terms of actual uh, bodily movement alone, as it does in, in, in pottery making. At the same time, it is a question of what exactly we mean by creativity, creative process and creative gesture. And there are different ways to think about it and different temporal scales. I mean, you can think of the process of making as a whole, as a creative process. And uh, I mean, and in some sense, all gestures are a part of, a, of, a, of, of the same process. You, can, you cannot just take some of them and say that, you know, this is uh, uh, different in terms of creativity than the others because you need them all. But at the same time, we are trying with the term of creative gesture to isolate some events of interest, which we think are uh, having a special role. And um, the way uh, so far we have been doing that is um, together with the potters, is that we are trying to remove out of the process more of the technical uh, uh, aspects of making. I mean, there are certain gestures that in different places, if you go, you will see them happening because they represent the two, three groups that they have to use when they do a certain uh, form, uh, specifically, let's say, at the island of Sifnos. There are four or five distinctive groups that they use to uh, uh, raise the, the uh, specific forms of, from clay. 
Now, in between those technical stages, there are movements that uh, you cannot, uh, you will never find identical things happening. And I think that those in between stages, in between the technical, uh, if you want, uh, uh, identifiable as technical uh, gestures, uh, give you some interesting insights in terms of, uh, of the uh, ability to create something new. Uh, of course, creating new things in hand making pottery, again, it's problematic because very uh, often the potters will see the recreation of something as the creative part. I mean, this is how they define their skills as being able to create, uh, you know, uh, the same thing many, many times, but in, in a manner that they consider to be uh, excellent. So this is what matters for them to produce, uh, uh, you know, good quality work. And that also involves a creative aspect. Although if you look at it, you might think, but you know, it's the same thing. It's never the same. I mean, there are interesting similarities and differences, but above all, it is something that is valued as creative um, for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nangas. Thank you very much.